Some events echo through the pages of history, causing ripples decades or even centuries later. These secondary consequences are sometimes a direct result of the events themselves, but more often than not, they are driven by our perception, the mythology that we build around those events. The narrative of 9-11 defined the past decade. It was used to justify the Patriot Act, the indefinite detention provisions in the NDAA of 2012 and 2013, and it was used to take America into war against Afghanistan, then Iraq. 4,000 Americans may have died on that day, but well over a million civilians died based on the story of what happened. Of course, the fact that so much death and destruction was justified using that narrative makes it emotionally difficult for many Americans to re-examine it. After all, admitting you were wrong when nothing is at stake is hard enough. But if the official story of 9-11 is wrong, then this would mean that the U.S. government killed all those civilians and shredded your constitution based on a lie. And some of you were cheering them on. When people need to believe something, the facts matter very little. Reality can be twisted and bent into any shape needed, information discarded, and contradictions ignored. Never underestimate people's willingness to delude themselves. In America, where the need to believe is most entrenched, you'll rarely see September 11th addressed without some people resorting to third grader level name calling. Tinfoil hat, conspiracy theorists, conspiratards, 9-11 nutters. I'm sure you've heard these. It's the lowest and least sophisticated flavor of logical fallacy, the ad hominem. But it works when you're dealing with people who operate on a third grade level. What's most hilarious about this attempt to stigmatize those who dare question the official story is the fact that many of the members of the actual 9-11 Commission have spoken out to say that the investigation was a sham. I want to start by asking you as co-chairman of the 9-11 Commission what your basic reaction is to this study by the Center for Public Integrity that shows there were 935 statements, false statements, by these top eight administration officials. Well, I commend what the Center has done. It's taken exhaustive research to go through all of the statements made by these top public officials and to pick out the instances where they just flat out told us what was not the truth in order to uh, move us towards war in Iraq. And I think you've performed a very valuable public service. And I hope the lesson that arises uh, that comes from all of your work is that uh, all of us have to be more skeptical of statements made by our public leaders uh, and be and scrutinize those statements with very great care. Look, uh, yeah. Why didn't they talk about Building 7 in the report? That's good. Why, do you, why do you think that was I don't really have any, I don't have an easy answer for no. it, but I would ask it. Can yeah. you see this medical thing right now? Yeah, anyway. Thank you. Do you support a criminal investigation in 9-11? Because I know yours was an exposition. It was It was not a criminal investigation. I don't think so, but I, but I, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, do, I do support a permanent commission to examine, not just that, but lots of other things in this area. But if it's a permanent cover-up, then it's, uh, it's, I mean, if it's an act of war and, it's, and it's, it's hiding things, which everyone on your commission knew that the Pentagon was changing their stories, lying to you, right. and it's a cover-up of an act of war, and under Article 3, Section 3 of the Constitution, it's treason. So yeah. unless we get to the very bottom of it, then we're still talking tre a treasonous exposition. This is a longer conversation. I'm not okay. sure you have, this will ever get to the bottom of it. We have to, or we can't save to. our country, sir. I don't think, well, if that's, the, if that's the condition upon which we're going to be saving our country, I don't Because the problem is it's a 30-year-old it's a conspiracy. It's, no, I'm talking about 9-11. That's what I'm oh, talking about. Oh, you are. You mean yeah. at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Guys, it doesn't matter if the people who actually ran the investigation say it was a scam. You're supposed to believe the official story. If you don't, you're crazy, unhinged, and maybe even a little bit dangerous. Listen, I know you don't want anyone to think you're crazy, but let's just take a look at a little bit of the evidence, just between me and you. I won't tell anyone, I promise. Now. This isn't a two-hour documentary, so we don't have time to cover everything. Instead, we'll just confront a few obvious smoking guns. Smoking gun number one, the collapse of the World Trade Center Building 7. Three buildings collapsed in New York on that day. Two were hit by planes. Building 7 was not hit by a plane. No one claims that it was. Yet at 5.20 p.m. on September 11th, it collapsed into its own footprint. It went straight down at free fall speed. At first, NIST tried to deny this and placed its computer models over the actual video evidence. But in their final report, they do in fact admit that the building fell at freefall. Why is this significant? It's just like taking your car keys out and just dropping them. That's how fast the building came down for over 100 feet. This is high school physics. A building cannot do freefall with 40,000 tons of structural steel in its structural system without it being blown up. It's the only way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed, and precisely placed explosives. In other words, controlled demolition. 
funny thing is, in spite of the fact that never in history had a steel frame building collapsed due to an office fire, a lot of people knew the building was going to collapse before it came down. We have CNN reporting the collapse an hour before it came down. We are getting information now that one of the other buildings, Building 7, in the World Trade Center complex is on fire and has either collapsed or is collapsing. We also have the BBC who reported the collapse even though the building was still visible in the background. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. Apparently that's only a few hundred yards away from where the World Trade Center towers were. And it seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened uh, during uh, this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. There's almost a sense downtown in uh, New York behind me, down by the World Trade Centers, of uh, just an area completely closed off as the rescue workers try to do their job. But this isn't the first building that um, has suffered as a result. We know that part of the Marriott Hotel next to the World Trade Center also collapsed as a result of this huge amount of falling debris from 110 floors of two, the two twin towers of the World Trade Center. As you can see behind me... The we have footage of people on the street warning that the building was about to collapse. How did they know that this was going to happen when it isn't even physically possible for an ordinary office fire to bend or melt steel? It makes about as much sense as a farmer suddenly warning you that his pig is about to levitate. And this brings us to smoking gun number two. Explosions in the basements of the Twin Towers and on the lower floors of Building 7. I worked in the building for 20 years. I was the person in charge of all the stairwells of the North Tower. And on 9-11, I had the only master key that opened the doors that rescued people. This is the master key. They call wow. it the key of hope. And uh, uh, basically, I was a janitor. Like I said, on that day, there was an explosion on the basement. And uh, this is prior to the building got hit by the plane. And then the plane hit. And then there was a series of uh, explosions afterwards. And a person comes running into the office uh, saying, explosion, explosion, explosion. His skin was pulled all from his armpits all the way to the top of the fingertips and pieces missing off his face and then it was total chaos. And you are Kenny? Jahanneman. Spell your name. J-O-H-A-N-N-E-M-A-N-N. -N. And you were working there? As yes, I was right there. I was, in the, I was down in the basement, came down, all of a sudden the elevator blew up, smoke, I dragged the guy out, his skin was hanging off, and I dragged him out and I helped him out of the, out of, to the ambulance. Mr. Hess came running back in. He said, we're the only ones up here, we got to get out of here. He found the stairwell. So we, we subsequently we went to the stairwell and we're going down the stairs. When we reached the eighth or the sixth floor, the landing that we were standing on gave way. There was an explosion and the landing gave way. And we're, I was left there hanging. I had to climb back up and now I had to walk back up to the eighth floor. I was trapped in there for several hours. I was trapped in there when, when both buildings came down. All this time, I'm hearing all type of explosions. All this time, I'm hearing explosions. When they finally got to us, and they took us down to what, what they, they uh, called the lobby, because I asked them, I said, when we got down there, I said, where are we? He said, this was the lobby. And I said, you got to be kidding me. It was total ruins. Total ruins. Now, keep in mind, when I came in there, the lobby had nice escalators. It was a huge lobby. And for me to see what I saw it was unbelievable. I'm just confused about one thing and one thing only. Why World Trade Center 7 went down in the first place. I'm very confused about that. I know what I heard. I heard explosions. The, the, the um, expl explanation I got was it was the uh, fuel oil tank. I'm an old boiler guy. If it was a fuel oil tank, it would have been one side of the building. This of course brings us to smoking gun number three. Molten steel found in the basements of the buildings after the collapse. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Like molten bit. steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. So if you have a flame at 750 degrees, 
you can hold that flame under a steel beam forever and you'll never reach a high enough temperature to bend steel, let alone melt it. It wasn't just Building 7 that went down like a controlled demolition. All three buildings that collapsed in New York that day came down at freefall speed. The thousands of tons of steel and concrete beams that should have resisted such a collapse were blown apart as the building was falling. Over 1,700 licensed architects and engineers have gone on record to say that the official 9-11 story is physically impossible. It would have required carefully placed explosives to take out the support beams. And guess what? The dust from the ruins of the towers has been independently tested and shown to contain large quantities of military-grade nanothermite. The results of these tests were peer-reviewed and published in the Open Chemical Physics Journal in 2009. However, the agency behind the official investigation, NIST, has refused from the very beginning to test for any accelerants or explosives in the dust. This in spite of the fact that such testing is explicitly called for in fire investigation standards for events involving this kind of damage. My name is Mark Basile. I'm a chemical engineer. I have a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I've worked for about 25 years in industry and the majority of what I do is analytical work uh, and figuring out what materials are composed of, why they are what they are, why they do what they do. It's uh, basically a lot of material science is what I do. In December of 2007, I attended a conference in Boston on 9-11 where Stephen Jones was going to be speaking about his work on the iron-based microspheres. I attended the conference and listened to him talk where he also, uh, for the first time, discussed his discovery of the red-gray chips that we'll get into a little bit later here. Uh, after he spoke, I approached him and I was interested in being in, put in contact with a source for World Trade Center dust to independently uh, look at the material and either confirm or deconfirm uh, what he had found. Uh, about a month later, I received my first sample of World Trade Center dust from Jeanette McKinley, which was one of the individuals that you know, was spoken of in his uh, report on the thermetic materials that he put out in March of 2009, I think it was. Um, so anyway, I received a sample of dust in January of 2008 and basically started working with the material. Um, I found iron-based microspheres in there, just as he had done, uh, and I also found the red-gray uh, chips that he had spoken of. I created an apparatus where I could basically control uh, energy input to the chips, heating them resistively on a stainless steel heater strip uh, to an ignition temperature, not overheating them, but just bringing them up to the ignition temperature and then analyzing the uh, resultant products. And what I can confirm also is that these chips, the red layer is thermitic, it does produce molten iron, and I've seen it in a number of chips that Janet or Jeanette McKinley supplied to me, and I've also seen it in an independent sample that was also supplied to me from a museum in New York, which is asked to remain anonymous at this point. One of the things I'd like to stress about these chips is that they uh, really shouldn't be there. They're not uh, a natural formed um, agglomeration of aluminum from the aircraft or materials that were in the building and iron oxide that got knocked off. It isn't just a haphazard bringing together of iron oxide and aluminum which is the basic components of thermite. This is a material that um, is made up of nano sized particles that are all very uniform, very symmetrical. Uh, it's in a silica based matrix that holds the th whole thing together and when they're ignited these iron droplets that are formed uh, basically eat through the silica matrix and form both droplets and they actually creates these large relative voids within the residue of the chip that are all coated with iron films inside. We're not even scratching the surface here. No matter what part of the official story you look at, there are glaring holes that require magical thinking to explain away. You were lied to, pure and simple, and a lot of people were killed based on that lie. I know that's uncomfortable to look at, but it's the truth. So why are we looking at this now, 12 years after the fact? First of all, because the war on terror is still underway. There are people being killed right now because of this lie, and the federal government is grabbing more and more dictatorial power to supposedly protect you. Furthermore, those who control the US government are trying to find a way to take America to war with Syria, a war which will draw in Iran, Russia, and China, World War III. But the American people aren't going for it. They aren't buying the propaganda. So to convince the people to back this war, they're going to have to do something big. Something that makes 9-11 pale in comparison. This is just how they operate. Problem, reaction, solution is pretty much the only tool they have at their disposal. Originality is not their forte. The stigma surrounding 9-11 research and the juvenile way that the uninformed attempt to cower those who speak out into silence is more than just an obstacle to truth. 
As long as the powers that be think that they can get away with this kind of thing, and as long as you keep accepting their ridiculous stories at face value, they'll keep doing it. Waking up isn't a matter of personal preference. It's a question of life and death. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall he had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. For more videos like this, subscribe to Storm Clouds Gathering on YouTube. For updates, bonus content, and to influence future videos, follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash stormcloudsgathering. Our Twitter handle is Collapse Updates, and our website is stormcloudsgathering.com.